Bayaka would go into the middle of the forest and the Bayaka would do this <coughs> call, which sounds ridiculous when you do it in a sitting room in Bristol. Um, but that is the sound that an injured Dyker makes. Gavin Thurston is an award-winning cameraman specialising in wildlife. He has worked on 17 of Sir David Attenborough's series and has travelled and filmed on all seven continents and at both North and South Poles. Gavin, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank um, you very much for asking. <laughs> it's a pleasure. So I just wanted to ask you firstly about your book. I mean, you've achieved so much already. What, what was it that made you decide to turn your hand to writing? About, well, as you probably know, or if you don't know, I've worked a lot with David Attenborough over the years, and he's an avid writer, and I've read many of his books, um, and he's a brilliant storyteller. And if you would sit on location, if you sit down for dinner, he would always hold forth and tell a story, and everybody around the table is captivated, as we would understand. Um, and we take it in turns to tell the odd story. And the number of times people would say, God, Gavin, you've got so many great stories, you should write a book. And people said it for years and years. And eventually you think, oh, yeah, but yeah, I should write a book. And um, so about, oh, probably 14 years ago now, I actually did start to write a book. And I was all enthusiastic and I sat at the typewriter, well, computer, and I'd type away for two hours and then I'd get a coffee and I'd sit down and I'd read it back and it said, and then I went to Africa, it was hot, I liked it a lot. And it was just like a child of seven had written their stories. And that kind of put me off. But um, David uh, did say to me, he said, look, you know, if you get your book finished, you know, before I'm gone and still around, he said, I'll, I'll write a forward for it. And that was kind of the, the carrot dangled in front of me to get that book written. And then, amazingly, about, I mean, that's still plodding away for 10 years, I still never got it written. And then three years ago, Orion Publishing, Emily Barrett, um, commissioning editor, got in touch with me out of the blue and just said, we keep seeing your name on the credits on television. Have you ever thought about writing a book? You know, you must have an amazing, you know, a whole wealth of stories. Um, and I signed on the line and the rest is history. Was it tricky to, to turn to, to writing? Was it something you've always done? A lot of people that I've been speaking to have been exploring, always tend to keep diaries. Is that something that you had been doing that you could refer um, to? Yeah, very, well, very early on in my career. In fact, when my career started, I kept diaries. Literally every day I would religiously write down what had happened and how I felt. Um, and I did that for about 15 years. And of course, as you get older, you get distracted by the bar at the end of the evening or whatever it might be. Um, so that writing got more sporadic. Um, but one thing I did keep is all my schedules for all my shoots. So I, I think I have something like, oh, I don't know, 95% of the schedule. So a schedule for the, if you, if you don't know, or call sheet um, lists where you're going, when you leave, what flight you're taking, what hotel you're staying, where you get your hire car, what scientist you're working, what the subject is, what the program is. It's literally like the Bible for every film shoot you go on. And I have all of those. And my son kindly, um, my youngest son, Harry, kindly put them all in order, got rid of all the duplicates, and he put them all into a spreadsheet. So now I can go into my spreadsheet. This sounds really nerdy, I know. But I can go into my spreadsheet and I can tap in David Attenborough and it'll come up with, you know, 70 or 80 shoots I've done with David or Kenya and it'll come up with 30 shoots. Or So for me, the way my mind worked, it helped formulate where I'd been, what I'd done. And I made notes in that spreadsheet um, just to remind me of the different events and different stories, you know, whether it was filming, uh, you know, volcanoes in Hawaii or being charged by elephants or whatever it might be. And that then helped me get these stories down. And the other thing I did do um, through my career is I used to be very good at sending postcards. So every shoot I went on, I would always send a postcard to my mum or my granny or my wife or whatever. And my mum, probably a bit nerdy like me, she kept every single postcard, including my granny's. And um, when I started writing the book, my mother gave me I know, a whole stack of postcards from all over the world. And of course, they've got the date, they've got the stamp of where they were posted. And in there also, there's another set of emotions that came through that were kind of praised in postcard form. So with all that information, um, had a lot that's to work with. enough. And of course, the other thing is companies like the BBC very kindly put together these amazing series yeah. of all the footage. <laughs> So I have like the most professional, um, you know, home video collection of every trip I've done. So I want to ask you about your granny because she's played quite an important role, I think, in your career, from what I can tell. Um, could you could you tell us about her influence on you and and the connection to nature? My granny was just like an old-fashioned amateur naturalist. 
she was super keen on wildlife, on the birds, the bees, the trees. I think it was her interest in that and in nature that kind of must have rubbed onto, onto me at an early age. Um, so yes, she did. She had a huge influence on me. One of my earliest memories actually was my granny taking me to Selborne um, in Hampshire uh, or Sussex, wherever it is down south, um, to show me the, um, where Sir Gilbert White lived. Now, Sir Gilbert White was a, I think he was a 17th or 18th century naturalist. Um, and he was probably one of the earliest British naturalists who started documenting all the, the natural history of England. And one thing he had at his house is a, it's called the Zigzag. It's a great place to visit. And um, he had this path cut in the hillside that goes up the hillside from, I don't know, I think it goes up about 300 feet. And what's interesting is he documented the change of the vegetation just in that short climb up to his house. And I remember my granny walking me up there and showing me the range of flowers and butterflies and bees and beetles and so on. Um, and it's something that really stuck in my mind. So then how did you take this passion and turn it into such a successful career? So when I was age nine, I went on a school trip and uh, we went to Dudley Zoo in, um, uh, near Birmingham. And my um, kind Auntie Mary lent me a, a box brownie. In fact, don't go anywhere because I <laughs> let me grab it. I'll show you what a box brownie is. I've got to be honest, I've never seen a box brownie before. Well, there we are. That is a box brownie. Is that um, the, the box brownie? This is the box brownie. It's a very basic camera. So it has a lens on the front. You have this viewfinder at the top, um, but you can shoot, like with your iPhone, you can shoot portrait or landscape and it's got another waist level viewfinder. So you have to stand and you have to frame up by looking down through here. Um, and then literally there's a very simple button on the side. You just wind the film on, click, that's it. There's no aperture, there's no focus, there's nothing. Anyway, so armed with that, and this takes a roll of 12 pictures, armed with that as a nine year old, I went to the zoo and I think the first picture, well, it was about two weeks later, um, I went with my mother to Boots to go and pick up the um, the photos that's what you used to have to do there's probably a lot of people who don't realize that you can't just <laughs> you have to wait to see. Show it. yeah you had to wait you know days or weeks before you could see the photos and i think the first photograph was i don't know my feet or the front door or something and there was a <laughs> giraffe or an elephant or something but about the fourth photo on the on the roll was an orca almost completely out of the water with its nose touching a, a beach ball held by a keeper and I showed my mum and I said, see, I told you, I told you I'd seen this giant fish leaping out of the, the ocean. And that's, or out, sorry, out of this swimming pool. And that's when I realised the power of photography. Okay, we know now that orca shouldn't be in captivity and things are moving fast to, to change that around the globe, which is very, very positive. Um, but one thing I realised is I can actually show you that picture now. I'd have to go and dig it out. Um, so 40 odd years later, 48 years later or something, I can show you that photograph. I can show you that split second moment when that animal did that thing. So, and suddenly I realized the power of photography and the fact that the, the subject matter was an animal. Um, so that I think that was probably a defining moment when I realized that was possibly a career path to follow. <clears throat> Can you tell me about your work with chimpanzees? I've, I, I enjoy working with primates full stop. So, you know, whether it's the great apes like gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, or whether it's, uh, the, you know, just primates in general with monkeys. I think the one nice thing is I, I didn't go to university, so I didn't, haven't got a biology or zoology degree. I didn't do behavioral science or anything. So my observations have learned by working alongside scientists. Um, and I think the nice thing about primates um, and particularly chimpanzees and gorillas, which are so close to us um, genetically, is that you don't have to be a scientist to read behavior. You can tell just by from expressions or body language whether they're angry or whether they're happy or whether they're relaxed. Um, they, they give us so many visual clues from just, just the way they behave, just as humans do. You know, you can see a, with a human whether they're getting tight-lipped and angry or whether the eyes are narrowing or there are so many subtle cues we read all the time and you do it automatically. Um, and chimpanzees are, are, you know, one of those animals that you can do that with. So it's always a joy to work with those primates so closely. The Republic of Congo to the north, Congo Brazzaville, uh, is where I went to, to do a shoot to see um, the innocent chimpanzees. And it's amazing. So you'd go wander through the forest um, and it looks to the untrained eye pretty much like any forest. Um, and we would go with the Bayaka pygmy trackers. And what they would do is they would do this injured diker call. So it's kind of cheating. It's a bit like using a, you know, one of those duck call things to call in ducks. 
Anyway, these, the biaka would go into the middle of the forest and the biaka would do this <coughs> call, which sounds ridiculous when you do it in a sitting room in Bristol. Um, but that is the sound that an injured diaka makes. And as you know, chimpanzees will occasionally hunt, probably about every week or 10 days they'll hunt um, for meat. Uh, so when they hit, the chimpanzees hear that call, they go running to it because it's an easy meal. You know, there's going to be a diaka with a broken leg or something. Anyway, so we're sat there quietly and this biaka does this call. And the next thing we hear this sort of rustling of leaves and out of the forest, just from nowhere, come these two chimpanzees expecting to see an injured diker at the foot of a tree. And instead there's a film crew and a couple of biaka trackers. And literally they just stop. And they just looked at us all. I mean, they're eight feet from us. And they're thinking, what the? And where's my lunch? Literally, yeah, where's my lunch? <laughs> and what the bloody hell are these weird chimpanzees? You know, they've got clothes on, they've got pale faces, they're hairless. Um, and literally, they just stared for minutes and they would look at each other for reassurance. They would hold hands, the chimpanzees. And eventually, after about, I don't know, five, ten minutes, I can't remember. Um, they then, you know, because we didn't do anything, we just sat quietly. They then just climbed up the trees and, you know, about sort of 10, 15 feet. Just the, the two of them, they just folded some branches over, made a nest each. And then they just settled down in these nests and just stared at us. And they were thinking, well... We're just going to wait and see what the bloody hell you are and what you're going to do. And um, we had this encounter. I mean, they hung around for hours, um, but it what was just. Most... Did you just stay still? Initially, stayed still because obviously you didn't want to frighten them. Even though I was there to film them, if you suddenly spin a camera around, there's a good chance you could just spook them. We'd never see them again. So we wanted them to be comfortable with us. And then I would very, very carefully move the camera around and line up a shot, see where they were, and just pick off the different shot sizes. But um, it was the most remarkable experience. And it's, it was really nice to see that there were some animals left on this planet that haven't been so persecuted by man. You know, anywhere else, if a chimpanzee sees you or hears you, it will just leg it because of the chance it's going to get hunted because they've been hunted for decades, for centuries. Um, but these chimpanzees, because they were innocent of man, um, they just sat there. Just curious. But another remarkable thing, and again, I wrote about this in the book, before I first went to um, the Congo, a friend of mine, Mark, um, had been out there years before on an Oxford University expedition. And he said to me, he said, oh, if you're going out there, there's this amazing story. There are these ants um, which get parasitized by a fungus. So oh, you've got yes. fungal spores drifting through the air. And basically, if one of those fungal spores gets breathed in by the ant through its spiracles and the, the side of its body, one it's a bit, I mean, this is very relevant with, you know, COVID-19 at the moment, but to think that something pretty much microscopic can change how your body reacts. Anyway, with the ants, if one of these fungal spores gets into the ant, it will then germinate and that fungus will grow through the ant's body and it'll grow to the, it'll send out whatever they're called, mycelium to the, the, the ant's brain. And there's enough information in one fungal spore to reprogram that ant's behavior so that ant will then walk up a branch, it'll climb up a branch about 18 inches off the ground, up, or a little twig, it'll latch on with its jaws, and then basically it lets go with its legs and hangs onto the twig with its jaws, and then basically is just eaten from the inside. It's the called fungus. a death bite, isn't it, I think, when it latches oh, on? Oh, well, I haven't heard that, but it could well be, yes. I've heard, and it, do you know the name of the fungus? Is it a cordyceps? Blimey, look at you. I you know. it. I'm just curious. <laughs> no, no, it, could, it could be. Did you study geology or something then? No, no. I just, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, mushroom drinks that you can have that are meant to be very beneficial post-workout or, or oh, yeah. performance enhancing in any. And one of them is cordyceps. And I looked it up and it came up with these ants that, that then get taken over and start essentially committing suicide so they can become this feeding ground for the for the fungus to grow and so that was the last time i had one of those drinks <laughs> <laughs> too off doesn't it you finding bite marks on your house plants yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do you feel a strong sense of responsibility when you're out in these incredible places filming that the the world you're portraying or, and will be portrayed is going to be something that influences next generations of thought and behavior yeah, I suppose when my career started, I didn't, you know, there was such adventure in going to these wild places and filming that, you know, you're caught up in that. And obviously you want nice imagery and nice stories. But I think as my career has gone on and you realise how much of that wild habitat is dwindling, 
at, you know, because of greed, the greed of man, that there is a, a responsibility to not just to document it for history, but to actually document it and share that information with the viewers in the hope that enough of us will change our habits or put pressure on governments or whatever to actually make a difference. Um, yeah, so I kind of feel that there is a responsibility, but also there's, there's something quite pleasing if you can actually, just with a camera and an eye and, and some effort, you can influence you know, huge numbers of people to make change for the better. And is that something that inspires you? What inspires you when you're going out and doing these incredible shoots? What is it that drives you? I suppose most of it is actually a selfish endeavor, I'll be honest, <laughs> is I get, such, I get such enjoyment out of being out in the wild places and seeing wild animals and you know, being away from traffic noise and aircraft and pollution and plastic and God knows what else. Um, I suppose the first, yeah, the first reason for my career is purely selfish to be able to experience those places. Um, but I suppose, yeah, as my career has gone on, it's pretty much like David Attenborough that, um, you know, for years and years and years, he would document the natural world, but he would never actually kind of put his name. He would never stamp his foot like a David Bellamy about conservation. And it's only in the last, what, sort of eight or 10 years where he's started to really you know, tell us now, he said, no, this is our last chance. You know, you must change your habits. Um, you know, so much so that he talks at United Nations, he talked at uh, Davos in Switzerland. Um, you know, he's, on all, he's invited to talk on climate change and all sorts of things. And he is using his experience and his travels and his knowledge to actually, you know, try and affect a change. Have you seen changes happening over the years of your filming um, in terms of the way that people are treating these animals? Um, do you think that there are any positives coming out of it? The world is slowly being destroyed by humans. We, you know, we're taking too much, we're greedy. Um, but, and it is quite sad when you go to places, particularly if you revisit somewhere and you think, God, last time I was here, this was all forest. I mean, it sounds cliche to say, I remember when all this was, you know, forest um, and now it's all fields, but it's very true. There are lots and lots of places um, you go and they've, they've changed over the decades. Um, but I think one positive thing is, is humans are supposedly the most intelligent species on the planet. And I think enough of us now are changing our habits. I mean, look at, just take the UK with it, you know, the use of plastic bags or plastic straws. The fact that each of us have made a, okay, it was kind of driven by government, you know, charging 5p for a bag. But many of us in the UK are choosing not to have a plastic bag in you know in the supermarket we're taking our reusable bags you know now if you go into a, a cafe and you see somebody drinking with a plastic straw it's almost like you know when people used to light up a cigarette in a room yes. you know people are looking shocked that you're actually choosing to drink through a single use plastic straw that's going to choke some poor turtle in the pacific yeah. um so i think that humans we you know we have enough knowledge now of of what we're doing to the planet and there is a massive movement for us to change our our ways um, I want to ask you also about the animals that you've worked with and, and which one has frightened you the most? Are there any animals that you have particular, not necessarily because of an incident, but just because of its behavior other than mankind? Um, yeah, I'd say top of the list in terms of frightening animals would definitely be mankind. Or human. I don't know why it's called kind even. Because, <laughs> I know, it's uh, just wrong, not, right? <laughs> um, I think one, uh, one sort of genre of animal, one species of animal that I've always had um, respect for is snakes. Yes. I'm not very good at identifying snakes. So basically any snake I come across, it doesn't matter if it's the UK or wherever, I kind of just treat them with respect and treat them as if they're venomous. There's a story in my book about when I was filming, um, I was trying to film um, lace monitor lizards returning to their eggs, which were buried in a termite mound, um, to release the young when the eggs hatched. Yeah. And I sat there for 17 days and because um, monitor lizards don't have very good eyesight, you don't have to sit in a, a blind necessarily. So I had this kind of very crude bit of sort of green cloth over my head and over the tripod. And I just sat on this branch day after day for 17 days. And I'll add, I didn't get the shot in the end. Um, but during that time, um, I saw all sorts of things. It's amazing if you sit in one place in, in nature, in the wild for 10 hours, you see all sorts of extraordinary things. Um, but one thing I did see, which I didn't necessarily want to see was one day, I was sat there and at the corner of my eye, I saw a movement 
and I saw this snake, it was about I don't know, 20, 30 feet away, and I saw this snake moving across the, the forest floor, and it went into this tiny bush, which was no bigger than this, it disappeared completely. And now it had my attention, so I was watching this tiny bush. And a few minutes later, it came out from that bush and came across, and there was another bush it was heading to. And in between these two little bushes, there was a little skink that ran across. Anyway, the snake grabbed the skink, bit it, and ate it there. You know, so I saw wild predation. I, you know, I wasn't on it to film it. I was waiting for the lace mollusk to listen. And then it then went into the next little bush, and it was now a lot closer. Anyway, eventually it came out of that bush and started coming to the next bush. And I realised the next bush or the next bit of shade was me oh, no. under this hood thing. And um, so I had, you know, I was doing all these calculations in my mind, thinking brown snake, long, venomous. It's thinking I'm a bush. Is it going to be pissed off when it realises I'm not a bush <laughs> and I'm just a hide? And at that, I mean, I felt such a fool, but I just threw the thing off, <laughs> threw the thing off my head, ready to Make run. It. <laughs> and the snake stopped as well and shot off the other way. And I this way. But um, yeah, I, I mean, the idea of being bitten by a snake doesn't exactly thrill me. But the more you learn about these animals, the more you realise they're not malicious. They're not out to just deliberately do you harm. They're, it would be a, you know, a protective or defensive strike if it, if it struck at you at all. Is it hard acting as a witness in certain circumstances where your job is just to sit back and film whilst nature is sometimes quite cruel? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people ask that and they also ask, you know, do you feel like you should intervene? You know, if you see a, a lion stalking a gazelle, should you clap your hands and warn the gazelle? But you've also got to bear in mind that if you weren't there, these things would be happening all the time anyway. So we are there literally as a witness and we shouldn't be, in, you know, man influences things on this planet all the time. So we shouldn't be, you know, changing what would happen naturally. There was one time when I did intervene. And again, it's controversial. Uh, you know, somebody said, well, you shouldn't have done it. Or in fact, some people did. Um, again, I was filming monitor lizards in Australia. And uh, this time it was a Parenti, which is the second largest lizard on the planet after the Komodo dragon. They get up to about, I think, two and a half meters long. And one th the particular bit of behavior is that they patrol the beaches at turtle um, hatchling season when the turtle hatchlings are coming out. And any hatchlings that come out in the day, they'll hunt them down. They'll run down and grab them and eat them. Yeah. Uh, but they'll also stick their nose in the sand and dig out any, if they can sense that, um, or presumably smell that hatchlings have hatched out and are waiting to merge in the evening, that they will dig down and dig the hatchlings out and eat them. And um, I'm sure you've seen pictures of baby turtle hatchlings. They're beautiful. They're sort of disc shaped, this sort of size. They're so, so cute. They look like little clockwork toys. Um, and myself and the producer, we were basically lying in the shade watching this beach for about a week. And day after day, and in, in the daytime, um, turtle hatchlings would emerge and they'd start off down the beach and you'd see the silver gulls, these big flocks of silver gulls come over and not a single hatchling made it to the sea. Oh. Every single time it was the gulls that caught them. Anyway, after about five or six days of seeing this, um, some hatchlings came out very near to where we were uh, with the camera. And without saying a word, um, we could see right down the beach, these silver gulls had also seen them and they, this flock was wheeling around and starting to come up the beach. And the two of us literally both just got up. We bunched our t-shirts up, bundled all these hatchlings in, oh. went down and put them into the sea. And the gulls still ate half of them. But I mean, we just could, you know, we just see carnage after carnage after carnage and just these beautiful endearing little turtle hatchlings. We just felt, you know, without a word, we felt that we couldn't just let it happen again. And when people say, well, you shouldn't have interfered, I. I would kind of justify it by saying that, you know, man is killing these things by the thousands every year, whether it's because they've got, you know, hotel or cafe lights, which are inland, which distract the turtles and they send them the wrong way at night, or they're run over by cars or the beaches are destroyed. Um, so I think by j attempting to save, you know, eight, eight, 80 turtle hatchlings, um, I don't see anything ethically wrong with doing that. No, I completely agree. It sounds like the girls were full anyway. Um, so oh, they would have got a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, well, the girls can eat other things anyway. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask you about the submersible because for so much of your work, you're in these incredible places where it can get quite claustrophobic, I imagine, in these very dense forests um, where you can't really see that far ahead of you. But there's uh, for me, there's a big difference between that and being 
in one of the deepest parts of the ocean. Um, how was it for you? Uh, yeah, so I was, well, you're referring to me filming for Blue Planet 2. Yeah. Um, so I was asked if I would be interested in filming the deep programme, programme 2 of, of Blue Planet 2. And that would involve spending time in submersibles on the bottom of the ocean or mid-ocean or whatever. And of course, the, you know, the idea of that is like somebody saying, would you like to go to space? Of course. Yeah. Um, anyway, so we flew out. The first trip was off the, um, the Barrier Reef. Um, so we flew out to Cairns. We met up at the boat. We got on the boat and then the boat heads out to, to sea. And it was about two days cruising to get out to where we were going to be filming lanternfish in, in the depths. And um, lanternfish are allegedly the most common animal on the planet. They're kind of this kind of size. And they're called lanternfish because they actually glow at night. They actually emit a beautiful sort of blue light. And um, so that was the plan. Anyway, during this two-day cruise going out, um, you've got the submersible team preparing the submersibles for the dives, you know, checking batteries, pumping oxygen, cleaning windows, you know, or setting up the cameras, the lights, all the rest of it. And being a newbie, of course, I wasn't allowed to touch anything, you know, <laughs> don't know anything about them. So, you know, you're trusting your life being in this thing, so you don't want some idiot unplugging the wrong thing. Well, you know. Um, so I was just thinking. Um, I, well, the, uh, my nerves were building. So basically over these two days, I was making tea and coffee and taking the biscuits and just trying to be helpful by not touching anything. Um, but during those two days, I was looking at this submersible and it's basically a, a six foot um, diameter perspex ball in a kind of metal frame with all the gadgetry. And then there's a big hatch, metal hatch at the top, which closes. And uh, each time I was looking at this thing, I was thinking, shit, what happens if we get all the way out to the barrier reef and like I get in it to the, do the first dive and they lower us into the water and as they shut the hatch, I freak out. Imagine then what am I going to do for the next three weeks on the boat? I'm just going to have to sit there twiddling my thumbs because I couldn't get in this thing. And I was kind of making myself anxious that I might be anxious. Anyway, eventually when I did get in the, the submersible, the hatch closes and we get lowered into the waves. Of course, it's the most amazing experience ever. Um, and I was absolutely fine. But um, yeah, I was quite nervous. But the amazing thing about spending time in the submersible is every single dive we did, and I think I did oh, 70, 75 dives. So I did over 500 hours in that tiny little Perspex bubble with a, the producer or a scientist and the pilot. And pretty much every single dive, we saw new species. There's probably still half the planet to still explore. You don't have to go to Mars to see something new. So would you, would you do it again? Uh, well, I was actually lined up. I'm supposed to be, if I wasn't doing this interview now, and we, if we didn't have this wretched virus um, <laughs> calming the planet or sending us into panic, um, I was supposed to be working on a series called Ocean X, which is a, um, if you look online, you'll see, you'll read about it. It's basically a, a kind of Jacques Cousteau-esque um, series about ocean exploration. Um, and it's following the journeys of some scientists looking for new species and looking at existing species and what we need to do to protect and save them. Um, and the executive producer of that is James Cameron. So how are you surviving lockdown? For someone who is so passionate about being in the outdoors, it must be very hard. Well, I've got this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, no, I'm very lucky that we have a nice house in Bristol and we actually have a, a reasonable back garden. And if, if we hadn't had builders down the road, I would have done this interview in the garden. You would see there's just something really calming about being amongst greenery and hearing bird song and the wind through the trees and things. It's been fantastic and lots of bird song. Yeah, I mean the bird song's amazing. And one interesting fact about bird song is that in the cities, um, the birds' voices have got progressively louder over the, the decades because of traffic noise and human pollution noise. Um, so the um, scientists have studied that the I can't remember how they measured it, but the basically the the volume, the the decibel level of birds species in the city is much higher than that of that in the country. But what's interesting is when you turn that traffic noise off and the aircraft noise off and the helicopters off and the building noise off, that bird song is just extraordinary. I mean, it's so loud and so vibrant. I mean, it's been waking me up in the mornings. I mean, at 10 to five, the dawn chorus. I mean, it's, you almost have to put your fingers in your ears, but I mean, no, no it's, it's beautiful. Um, but it's something that we rarely notice because we're drowning it out with our noise pollution. Well, it's, an, it's an, a silver lining, I suppose. A small silver lining, yes. Thank you so much for your time, Gavin, and good luck with, with Ocean X. Thank you very much.